So I am Theodora Scarato, Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust, and I am so thankful and honored to be here today with Dr. Kent Chamberlain. Thank you for joining us. Uh, nice to be with you. Thank you. Great. Well, today I am um, just really excited for you to be able to share the New Hampshire Commission on 5G report and the recommendations and answer questions. Um, Dr. Kent Chamberlain is professor, professor and chair emeritus at the University of New Hampshire, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of New Hampshire. And you are the representative from the uh, University of New Hampshire for the 5G Commission, which wrapped up its report. Um, so I would just love for you to first present about the commission and for everyone watching, please put your questions in the chat and, or in the Q&A, and we'll be doing that after, but also during the conversation, if, if things come up, I'll point them out and you can elaborate as we go. Well, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. I think a good place for me to start off is with a conflict of interest statement. And the reason I feel this is important is that if you hear this information, you know, the information that I'm going to cover in today's presentation, but if you hear that from somebody from the telecom industry, I'll tell you, be telling you exactly the opposite of what I'm about to say. And of course, the motivation is, well, <laughs> what industry oftentimes has as motivation, and that is their own interests. Uh, so I need to let you know that I'm doing this for free. I've done my service on the commission. I've done all of the presentations that I've done after serving on the commission. Uh, and I do it for free because it's something that I feel that people need to know. But also you need to know that I'm not somebody who's anti-technology. Uh, perhaps when you hear the word professor, you think of somebody in an ivory tower uh, who's disconnected from what makes things work. And that's not true. I'm a, an engineering professor, as was mentioned in the introduction, as professor and chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I worked closely with industry. I had over 23 research contracts or research sponsors in my career. I've worked with people from, you know, the people who build wireless networks to people who, uh, for, to first responders. So I've done a lot of work on the ground, working with people to solve real problems. I am anything but anti-technology. My only concern though, is that the technology that I had once thought was harmless, turns out to be harmful. And so I'm here to tell you what that harm is and give you a general sense of what the problems are associated with it. So at this point, I'm going to go into and share my screen. And I'm assuming you can see it now. If you would just nod, <laughs> you can yes. see my fantastic. Yeah. So what I do plan to cover is going to give you an overview of the commission itself. You know, how did it form? You know, what was its timeline and all that? And what was the outcome and what's happening next? So that's the, the first item. And I think it's, it's obviously very important. But then so what are some of the fundamental con questions and concepts that relate to wireless communication that involve health that people should know about? Because a surprising thing that I find is a lot of people are totally unaware of some of these issues. And I got to admit, that when I was first appointed to the commission, I didn't think health would be much of a concern, but it turns out that it is. So I will go over some of those concepts and, some of the, and answer some questions that I suspect people have. And then I'm going to give an overview of peer-related literature, you know, a little bit boring, but I think you need to see that. We are drawing conclusions that go against what telecom says. Telecom, you know, their industry says, no, absolutely harmless. And we're saying, no, there is harm, so you need to see the evidence. And so I'll be going over that. And, and, and uh, then the political and financial driving forces, which are, of course, significant. So I want to let you know what's going on with that. So let's just talk about the commission itself. And it originated, or <laughs> the seed originated back in the winter of 2018. I have a, uh, a local resident, local to me in New Hampshire, and she is electro-hypersensitive. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about electromagnetic or electro-hypersensitivity, but it is a real thing. It's recognized by the ADA and Medicare. So she was concerned because she heard about new towers being rolled out in her area. And so she started seeking help. 
people, you know, I've got a problem, got towers coming in. And so fortunately, she was put to get, uh, uh, put in touch with Cecilia Desset. And by the way, I'm going to make these slides available. And so if you have similar concerns yourself, you might want to click on that link, talk to Cece, and get you know, information about what you might be able to do to stop the rollout of a tower in your area. But this is now going back four years or three and a half years. And so with encouragements from Cece, this resident, Deb Hodgden, reached out to others trying to build a, a coalition, you know, build some uh, effort behind this idea of stopping the tower. And well, it limited success in the building in the beginning. She she tried having a screening of uh, Generation Zapped. Perhaps you've heard of the movie and like only her relatives showed up. But eventually she got in touch with the right legislator. And, and I'm here so many stories that are like this. So she got in touch with a representative, Patrick Abrami, who's surprisingly a Republican because generally Republicans are not as... Uh, willing to go uh, do something, to look at something that might harm industry, but he was willing to. So he traveled with Deb and he talked with CC and he looked at all the information. He said, yeah, you have a legitimate concern. Let's form a commission to look at this. And so he partnered with a Democrat, a Senator Democrat, to form the commission to write the, the uh, bill that, would, that in, in the final analysis ended up forming the commission. So that was uh, the bill itself, and it's linked right here. Uh, just click on it, and you'll see what that five-page bill is all about. It was submitted in June of 2019, and I'll talk more about what was in that bill. And that legislation was passed by both houses of the legislature, and it was bipartisan, and it was signed by the Republican governor. So that gave us a good start. So the bill basically called for the formation of a commission that would take a deep look into the ra impacts of radiation exposure, particularly as it rate relates to 5G. And importantly, this is the first legislation in the United States, in the past legislation calling for the formation of a commission to explore the health effects of wireless radiation in 5G. So it was a first, and that was good also because it got us some good recognition nationally. So in the bill, and again, if you're thinking about doing something like this, I suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, that you go to that uh, bill and look at how it was written because it ended up working. But one of the questions is, why do insurance companies recognize radiation as a risk, but they won't insure against it? Even Lloyd's of London won't touch it. So why have the thousands of peer-reviewed journals showing their studies, showing that the radiation has been ignored by the FCC? That's a lots of data out there. A lot of science just says, hey, there's a problem with radiation exposure, low frequency or lower frequency radiation exposure, and the FCC is simply ignoring it. And then why are the FCC guidelines based solely on thermal effects? I'm not going to get into much detail. That's kind of the science behind it. But what the FCC says in their regulation is that if the radiation doesn't physically warm you up like a microwave oven does, then it's not a harm and we don't need to be concerned about it. And then why did the World Health Organization signify that wireless radiation is a group B carcinogen? And why is that fact, again, being ignored by the FCC? So please note that the FCC shows up three times here. So I will be addressing that. And that's part of the political aspect that's important to moving this whole issue forward. It centers around the FCC. Now, the specified commission on the, uh, for the commission membership, I'm, I've give, got the detailed list there, but the bill, the, that HB 522, is very specific about who should be on the, the, the commission. And one of the concerns or one of the objectives, I should say, of the commission framers were that we have the right people on the commission so that when we made a recommendation, it would have some, some gravity, that people would listen to it. So in the final analysis, we came up with 13 members. Note their backgrounds included physics, toxicology, electromagnetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, occupational health, medicine, uh, public health policy, <laughs> just reading off the list. But these were people that were on the commission. And certainly that's the type of background that you would want people to have if they're going to make a pronouncement going to make recommendations regarding a safety issue involving electromagnetic radiation. 
by the way, the where I show up on that list is the, as was pointed out in the introduction, the representative from the University of New Hampshire. So our timeline for our activities, well, we, so we've met 13 times. And that started in September 2019, over two years ago. And then it ended last, uh, uh, well, more than October, it was in November, we turned in our final report. So that was a year ago that we turned in our final report. And we heard from recognized experts. So we, we did a lot of homework ourselves and looking at peer reviewed journals, we brought in experts to our meetings and really got a good understanding of this issue of health effects, 5G, and just wireless radiation in general. So that's uh, leading us up to October. And then we had the, the commission uh, a subgroup. And I was on that subgroup that we did a final report. Uh, we wrote the final report and then went through that <laughs> wonderful uh, editing by committee to come up with uh, a report that the majority of us agreed on. Do have it linked right here. It's uh, oh yeah, and a comment. If you do want to read the report, uh, sometimes people click on it and then gasp because it's 390 pages. But let me tell you that there are only about 10 pages that really describe what our findings are. So the rest of it are archives, which of course are important, but for the most part, the report covers or the first 10 pages covers what our basic conclusions were and where we drew those conclusions from. So I list the experts who presented to the commission just for reference. Again, I'm, I've been told that a lot of people, a lot of states want to form their own commissions. This is both in the United States and outside of the United States. I'm hearing from people outside or from people abroad now, but just listing some of the people. And if you want to form your own commission, please feel free to contact me. I can give you insights into the people who really made a difference for us as a commission. Please note that Theodora Scarato is listed there. She presented to us and was very valuable. So she'll be one of the people I recommend. So sources of information uh, that we use to, to draw our conclusions, that's the outside experts. And I note here that all excerpts, experts, <laughs> except one provided clear evidence that wireless radiation poses a threat to human health and the environment, all but one. And that presenter who did not acknowledge those risks was the presenter from the telecom industry. He was also the only person paid to present. I think you can see that there may be a trend forming here and that'll show up later also. So well, so we looked at peer reviewed publications and the important thing is that what we found in the peer reviewed publications were, was consistent with what was told to us by the majority of the experts that we had show up, I'm all but one of the experts I should say. And that is wireless radiation is a threat and it does some bad things. And I'll be talking about what those bad things are in just a moment. So conclusions, now wireless radiation, I just said this, <laughs> including 5G poses a significant threat to human health and the environment. Um, a question I sometimes get is, is 5G worse? Uh, and the answer is, is we really don't know at this point. There are some indications that it is, some indications that it isn't. But in general, all wireless communication, the wireless communication you get from your cell phone, from cell towers, from baby monitors, from any of the Internet of Thing devices, they are all of concern. And also they add together, they're cumulative. So the more devices you have, the more exposure you're getting, and the more concerned you should be about it. Here's one thing. It's not a scientific issue, as I'm just mentioning that the science is pretty clear. It's a problem, just kind of like what I have in the first bullet. It's a concern. Um, but it is scientific, and I'll explain. I mean, it's not scientific because the science is clear. It's political. And I'll go through the, some of that po politics later on. And fortunately, there is some good news there also. Now, where the science will perhaps come in later is in addressing this problem. When you have a problem, if you haven't acknowledged it, clearly you can't solve the problem. But as an engineer in this field, I recognize full well that if we, once we recognize that we have a problem with radiation, there's a lot we can do to reduce that exposure. So let's recognize it first, get it out in, in the open so that we can then figure out the best ways to address it. And I'll talk about some of those ways coming up. 
general recommendations. I want to seek independent evaluation of the FCC guidelines. Well, that makes sense. Right now, you know, the FCC guidelines have been around since 1996, and they're based on science from the 1980s. I think you'll all agree that a lot has changed in terms of radiation since the 1990s. Uh, and we, we, as the commission, said that we would be working with our legislators to make that happen. But some other things have happened in the meantime that maybe means that we don't have to go through go that route. Also, we want to take you know action to alert the people, uh, people you, about the dangers of radiation. As I noted, is so many people I talk with just have no idea that their cell phones are not something that they should be putting in their pockets or stuffing in their bras. They are microwave transmitters with substantial powers. So for us to get out and let the public know, we felt was a very high priority. I want to encourage the migration to wired networking. That's one of the solutions. And it's fast. Well, I was amazed when I converted my computers at home to wired. You plug them in and they're incredibly much faster. They're far more secure and they don't radiate. So I have my little meter, and as soon as I started wiring my computer, I found that the radiation had substantially declined. Here is a recommendation uh, that we <laughs> are no longer going to go with, and that is to um, perform radiation level measurements at cell towers. We thought that'd be a great idea and make sure that nobody, none of these towers exceeds the FCC guidelines, but then we found out <laughs> You can't exceed those guidelines in almost any realistic scenario. In other words, once you're a few meters away from a cell tower, you're not going to go above the FCC limit. It's kind of like setting the speed limit at 500 miles an hour. Nobody's going to exceed it. So we decided that that really wouldn't be a priority. But we do want to enable public the public to perform their own measurements. And one way to do that would be to provide meters in public libraries. So if people are concerned about their exposure, they go to the library and they check one of these devices out, although the devices aren't really that expensive. I have a meter that's $150 and it does a pretty good job of telling me what my exposure is. And we can talk more about that later if, if people would like. Uh, also to establish a 500 meter setback for cell towers. And then, as you know, that if your cell tower is 20 miles away, you're, you're definitely safe. But and you know that if you're right in front of it, you're probably not safe. But where is that cutoff? So we as a commission found that 500 meters seems to be reasonable. And I will talk more about that later and show you where we came up with that number from. Now, in terms of the next steps, turns out legislation has already been written. I was involved. I was part of that team to write the legislation. And one aspect of that legislation is to implement that 500 meter setback. So uh, a neat or very uh, an important landmark is that that was approved. The legislation that we wrote was approved. And why that's a landmark, excuse me, <clears throat> a little bit rough throat today, sorry about that, is that we put the setback in the legislation and there was concern that the legal people who would be looking at that would say, no, you can't put that into your legislation, New Hampshire, because federal legislation says that you can't mandate a setback. So this is, we, we know that we're taking a risk by putting in something so powerful in our legislation, but if we didn't have something like that, we didn't feel like our legislation would be meaningful. So this is going to get voted on. Uh, it's going to be sometime, well, next fall, 2022. So the timeline, the idea, the seed of the legislation started back in 2018 in winter. It's not going to get voted on until 2022. So this gives you a sense of the timeline that's involved in getting legislation like this involved or, or acted on. And the problem is we know that this is an uphill battle. Uh, you know, there are a lot of legislators that have political aspirations that really don't want to be uh, in favor or be promoting our bill because they know that if they promote our bill, telecom might not support them and might support their opponents. 
So this is a very big political issue, but we feel like we've done the right thing. We've done what the commission has asked us to do, and that is to try to implement one of the recommendations. So that is kind of like the first, you know, just the overview of what happened with the commission. The next step is to address some questions that you probably have at this point. Uh, I don't know if any questions have come in in the meantime, uh, but if not, I'll go ahead to the next slide and answer a very important question. And that is, well, what happens when people are exposed to strong wireless radiation? Now here I use the word strong, but I also say it's well below FCC thresholds, probably 5% of FCC thresholds. And there are lots of examples about what happens, but this is a particularly well-documented example. And that's why I thought I would share it with you here. This goes back a good number of years when the cell industry wanted to put cell towers on or near fire stations. So they did that. They turned the, the, uh, the cell towers on. And what happened? So, I mean, in this case, you can see that the cell towers are close to where the firefighters work and eat, you know, because they stay there for extended periods of time. And so this is like having a cell tower near your home. So what happened? Well, I'm going to read this because it's important. And within a week of installation, many firefighters developed unusual symptoms of headaches, fatigue, insomnia, memory loss, confusion, nausea, and weakness. After a time, firefighters in stations with adjacent cell towers were found to have forgotten CPR or became lost responding to a fire in a city where they grew up. Now, if you want to read more about this, again, I'm putting a link to this. I understand that there's a book that's going to be coming out that describes this. And this is an important slide for a number of reasons. And one is, let's talk about what those symptoms are. Now, they're a little bit insidious. When you read the symptoms, headaches, fatigues, insomnia, memory loss, isn't that part of everyday life? Well, indeed, it can be. Maybe you had too much to drink last night. Um, maybe you have multiple chemical disorder. There are lots of things that give symptoms like that. But exposure to electromagnetic fields is one of them. And there are ways for testing it. And the other thing to note is that if you are experiencing these symptoms as a result of exposure to electromagnetic field, there are other things going on, like the creation of radical uh, oxidative stress in your body that could lead to other diseases. So I just wanted to show you this slide because it's really clear, and I've run into this again. Perhaps some of you have heard of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Came in, a company put in a cell tower there, and the, the people in the neighborhood didn't know when the cell tower was going to be turned on. But one morning, all of a sudden, the, the families were getting sick and they compared notes with each other and my gosh, and then they called the cell company. And it turns out that that day, the day they experienced those symptoms was the day that the tower was turned on. So you might not know that you're experiencing these symptoms unless you can compare notes with other people and you can relate when you experience those symptoms to something like a tower being turned on. So that's what I wanted to say here. This is what happens. Now, you, if you're farther from the tower, these, these firefighters were fairly close to the tower as you saw for the, from the picture. If you're farther away, the symptoms may be a little bit less. If you're, highly, if you're electromagnetically sensitive, <laughs> they could be a, a quite a bit more. So, What's the so, so given these problems, you know, it's certainly you would assume that the cell companies would know about this, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they do. What's their incentive for having such high limits on radiation exposure? And I'll talk about how high they are in just a moment. Well, one is it makes if you the standards were lower, your cell phone wouldn't meet those standards. So they want to keep them very high. You wouldn't be comfortable using your cell phone if you, you know, knew that it was above standards. Also, in terms of citing cell towers, it really has a lot to do with the cost of putting in a cell tower. And I'll give you an example in just a moment. If you put in a cell tower in a populated area, usually you have utilities that are available, you have access that are available, and you can get greater coverage area because you're right in the center of a populated area. So here's an example. 
And this is some uh, an example that I was I'm quite familiar with. It's Lenox, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the cell industry has come into the town of Lenox, and they say, "We there's a building you have, and it's at the center of that circle that I just drew, and we would like to put a cell tower there." And so you, it's right in the center there, and uh, it's a, a home for the disabled and the uh, elderly. So we'd like to put it there on top of the building. And if they were able to put it there, first of all, it would be a very low cost installation because access is there, power is there, other uh, resources are there. So it would cost very little for them to go into this building, put up an antenna and they would hide it so it wouldn't be obvious, turn up the power. And by turning up the power high enough but below the FCC limit, they'd get great coverage area. But the problem with that is that they would be providing people near the facility within that 500 meter radius, as I'm showing right here, it would be providing them with very high exposures that we now know cause physical problems. So an alternative, just to show you what the alternative is, but it's more expensive is go this point, put a tall tower where that red dot is, you put up directional antennas, you aim it in the town or other coverage areas that you want. It could be a, you know, clearly a directional antenna would be best. It would, nobody in town would be getting overly yeah, high doses of radiation, but it would cost more. You'd have to rather lease the property to begin with. You'd have to put in access roads. You'd have to put in utilities. So that's one primary, uh, primary motivation for the cell industry wanting to keep those limits, those thresholds very, very high. And of course, it's not good for us. So now I come up with a key question, and this is the one that I asked earlier. How far away should you be from a cell tower? So how far should you be from where people live, work, and recreate? There are still some questions about you know, whether or not you can have a cell tower, how far you should be away from a road. But we had to come up with some number for how far a cell tower should be from where people live, work, and recreate. And I'll show you where that came from in just a moment. And also, you know, that shows where we came up with that 500 meter setback. And to do that, I'm going to address a single study. There are lots of studies that support what I'm about to tell you. But I think by just going over this one study, you'll see you know, where we, how we came up with what our rationale was. And uh, let's just go right into what that study is. So this came from Brazil. An important thing to note is that it came from a fairly long time ago, in a time when a lot of people didn't have cell phones. Now, a reason that that's a good thing for what I'm about to tell you is it, it kind of isolates the impact of cell phones, having your cell phone on you, compared with the impact of the cell tower by itself. Now, it's true that your own cell phone is probably your strongest radiator, strongest source of radiation, but cell towers are there 24 seven and they do provide a, a lot of radiation that can cause the type of impact that I'm about to show you. Um, and what this does, this study right here, it, it's like I say from the Brazilian government, it takes a look using uh, government databases at the death rate from cancer as a function of how far people live from a cell tower. Do people who live closer to cell towers have a higher cancer rate than those who live farther away? This study addresses that head on. So that is a direct answer to the question that was asked. But this isn't you know, looking at only one cell tower. This is looking at 856 cell towers. So it has a pretty big N. A large number of towers, a large number of people were involved to give us a good sense of what's going on statistically and not just a one-off experiment. Something that'll be important mention, uh, later on I'll mention, and that is the highest power density seen during the entire study where they showed lots of, his, of, of health effects, but the highest uh, amount of radiation that they saw was 407.8 milliwatts per meter squared. You don't need to know the unit. Do keep this number in mind because it's only 5% of the FCC standard. So clearly the standard that we're using is, is not the right one. If you want to see the study and read it in greater detail, 
look here. But here is the bottom line for that study. And that is this plot right here, this, this says it all. And the red line right here represents the mortality rate, the death by cancer per, per 10,000 people for the people in the study. So as you can see here, that as you move away from this, the tower, the mortality rate declines. This blue line right here represents the mortality rate from cancers for the population in general. So it's very reassuring to see is that as you get far and far farther in from the tower, you start to have the same mortality rate as the population in general. This is pretty convincing. The cell industry does not like it. They've done a lot to attack it, but I'm not going to go into details about that now. I will have another video that addresses that. Um, the other thing to note is that this is a monotonic curve. It shows the dose dependence of radiation and the, the health problems, the health risks. So from this, now, oh, <laughs> to answer the actual question, Where's that 500 meters come from? There's 500 meters right here, and clearly the risk has not gone to zero. Um, and you're right. So where would you want to live? I'd like to live <laughs> out here somewhere. And fortunately, I do right now. Let's hope that a cell tower doesn't come in near me. But the reason this number was picked because is because it does show a significantly decreased risk. And it also shows that uh, it, it, it's, it's probably realistic. Um, I, I don't want to get into the details here. I, I've, I've, uh, I mentioned I was, I'm doing another video to address this, and there's a lot of debate back and forth. Uh, people are suggesting that we should have been you know, extended the, uh, the, the setback distance to something farther, but we didn't feel that was realistic. So it is a tightrope walk that you act when you're setting safety standards. Sometimes you want to have something that is reasonable and yet has that will allow things to happen, like setting a speed limit on a road. If you set the speed limit at three miles an hour, it's probably going to be safe, but it's not realistic. So we had to do something like that. And other researchers have come up with similar numbers, looking at similar data, and they come up with a setback distance of 500 meters. So without saying much more, I'll just simply say, that's where we came up with the number from, not simply this study, but the other supporting studies. Uh, how do FCC standards compare internationally? Well, you can see that we're up there near the top and actually our standards, um, this is shown as 6,000 uh, milliwatts per meter squared. It actually for some frequencies goes up here to 10. That's a huge amount of radiation. Uh, you can see that many countries follow suit. They, they just follow the lead of the F FCC and of the United States. That's happened for many, many years, although that may be changing. You can see that some countries do say, hey, those standards are ridiculously high. We're going to set lower standards. So it's kind of some of the basic things that you need to know. And before I get into the overview of peer-reviewed literature, maybe it's now time for me to stop, take a drink of water, and see if there are any questions that might be good right now. Um, one question is, what was, your, what was your opinion before you got involved in the commission? Yeah, that's a good one. I, uh, it, it's one of those things that you tend to assume as I was, it went through engineering school and I had a faculty member uh, working in electromagnetics, I climbed towers. I did a lot of work with transmitters and it was a basic assumption that the only radiation that you needed to worry about was from, from heating. In fact, we even talked about <laughs> at one point coming up with a microwave space heater where it would radiate you, you would become warm, but it wouldn't warm the surrounding air. We thought that that might be a great idea. So my belief was, that, hey, this stuff's pretty, pretty sane and you're pretty safe. And I thought that we would go to the, the commission. We would you know, talk with some people and we would find out that, nah, just like I've always thought, eh, there's no real concern here. We'll wipe our hands go back to our jobs, but that turned out not to be the case. So in the beginning, you know, I didn't think it was a problem. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>
I certainly didn't myself when I started on this. In fact, I fought pretty hard not to. Really oh my gosh! Get a base I, it. <laughs> you know the technology is wonderful. These these cell phones are works of art. They allow us to do incredible things. We can make them sufficiently safe that we can use them. Uh, I need to move on to um, talking about this overview of peer-reviewed literature. It's important because it's the backbone. Uh, some people that come up with that I, I talk with that say, oh, there's no problem. They are referencing journal, or not journal articles, not peer-reviewed articles, but industry articles. And there's a huge difference. I will assume that people are familiar with what a peer-reviewed article a journal is. I'll say a little bit more about it. Um, so what I'm going to show on the next slide are just some examples. You know, as I have noted before, there are thousands of publications that show that there are risks associated with exposure. So I'm going to show just a few of them, and I'm not going to. My objective in picking is some people might say cherry picking, but I'm going to address that issue also. Is that I want to show that we're not looking at complaints from a single article or from a, a group of authors or uh, complaints only about particular problems. Uh, we're looking at from articles from all over the world, from researchers all over the world, addressing problems, all, you know, all sorts of different health problems. So that's a good suggestion that we're not looking at something that, that's only found to be a problem by a select few individuals. That's not the case at all. And I think that what I'm about to show you will at least help convince you of that. Also, what the industry will claim is that these are the, the articles showing that there's a health risk are from fringe publications. Uh, I'm not really sure what a fringe publication is. Now, some of these articles are from niche areas. You know, uh, there aren't going to be a lot of readers for something that's very detailed scientifically. But by gosh, they are not fringe because all of the articles I'm going to show you have uh, authors, first of all, who are from well-known, reputable universities. The publications in which they are given, in fact, I'll talk more about that later, but they, uh, they have review boards that have people on those review boards who are from, you know, have the pr proper credentials. I mean, there are ways of telling what's good uh, publication and what's not. So note here that poor quality journals exist, but they are readily identified. And one thing that I did, and I should note that I was an associate editor for IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, for IEEE Transactions on Antennas and Propagation. Uh, it's the most prestigious, prestigious journal in my field. So as a, an associate editor, I was pretty familiar with evaluating other journals. And as a chair of an academic department, I was also familiar with uh, judging the quality of a journal because I had to do that for faculty members who were outside of my research area. They had lots of publications, were they any good? So I am familiar with this, I'm qualified, and that's one of the roles that I played on the commission was just to make sure that the publications we were referencing were quality publications. So all of the articles that I'm about to show you are relate to cell phone frequency radiation, and, and they talk about the various health effects that can happen from that. So what I do on these slides is I provide you, first of all, the title of the article. I give you a quote from the article. I give you a link to that article. And then, of course, the author is right here. So I'm not going to dwell on these, but I do want to point out in each of these things that I think you should know about. For example, this first one talks about oxidative stress. This shows up a lot. Oxidative stress creates free radicals. Perhaps you've heard of free radicals. They're not good. They are involved with aging, and it can lead to cancers. They can lead to other things like DNA damage. So this article right here, which you now can go read by simply clicking on it, and by the way, if you can't access the article because some of them you have to pay for, you might go to your public library and see if you can get it through interlibrary loan. I was able to do that, and I know of other people who have done that. So damage, if, if your cell phone causes damage in rat brains, you don't want it damaging your brain. Next one, and this is multifocal. That just means that it uh, starts with a single tumor and then spreads to multiple tumors. Breast cancer in young women 
with prolonged contact between their breasts and their cell phones. You know, a lot of women do that. They tuck their cell phones in their bras while the cell phone is turned on. And now this is a case study. And it just shows that right under, right under where they kept their cell phone, right under where the antenna was, is where the tumors formed. So clearly, the cell phones can cause cancer. Uh, next one. Uh, this is one, uh, oh, skin fibroblasts. So you're exposing your skin to radi cell phone radiation. It says that this can interrupt and have an impact on your fibroblasts, which of course, what forms new skin. The reason this is particularly important is that with 5G communication, they're going to use a higher frequency and that higher frequency tends to uh, concentrate closer to their body. In other words, it doesn't penetrate as deeply into your body. But if it's not penetrating deeply into your body, it means it's giving up its energy in your skin, which is your body's largest organ. And so this just this says right here is or suggests that 5G may be worse for the skin fibroblasts. And I like to keep mine healthy if I can. The next one is the, uh, and this is a very important one, this is by someone named Martin Paul. And it involves the neuropsychiatric uh, problems associated with exposure. And some of these are going to sound familiar. And note here that among the more, in fact, uh, let me highlight that. God, I might as well use it. So among the more commonly reported changes are sleep disturbances, that's like insomnia, headache, depression, depressive symptoms, fatigue, tired. I mean, all the things that we saw with the firefighters in California. But this was done in the laboratory under laboratory condition. You expose people to radiation. They don't know if they're being exposed or not, or you don't expose them and find out what their reported symptoms are. There are a number of studies like this, and they're all showing the same thing. So if you are, and this is, yeah, if you are experiencing any of these things, admittedly, we all do from time to time, something you might consider is turning off your Wi-Fi, turn off your cell phone. I've made this recommendation before and people have gotten packed to me and they said, it, it was incredible. Turned off the Wi-Fi at night, turned off phones and turned off all of my wireless devices and I'm sleeping better than before. Now, clearly there may be a placebo effect there, but even if there is and it's working, go for it. But this just shows that according to science, this the cell phone exposure can have very bad psychiatric impacts on you. Oh yeah, um, radiation, we, we know about, or we've brought, most of us have read about the decline in male sperm count over you know, 10, 20 years. And one possible explanation for this is exposure to fields. So if you take two, term, two test tubes with sperm in it and you expose one to radiation, cell phone radiation, like what comes away from your cell phone, and the other one you keep isolated, you're gonna find a significant decrease in the sperm count, motility, and all the good indicators of sperm health. So, um, and also where do men usually store their phones or where do they carry their phones? Right in their pockets, right close to where sperm is generated. Um, oh, so it's not only humans that are affected, turns out trees and vegetation, this is a, an earlier article, I can update it, there's a newer article that shows that there's well-documented damage to trees and vegetation when you put in a cell tower. And the problems start on the inside of the trees and then work around to the entire tree and degrade the vegetation quite a bit. So this is something that is, you know, now that we're concerned about trees and concerned about vegetation, we don't wanna add something else that's gonna cause a problem just like we don't want to cause more of a problem for our pollinators. So we all know that if you have insecticides, they're going to have a negative impact on insects, pollinators. Uh, but what we didn't know before is that you can get the same result, the degradatory uh, effects from cell, cell phones, cell phone radiation, cell towers. So if you have just cell towers, just cell phone radiation, it's going to have a very negative impact on, on pollinators, for example. But if you combine that with insecticides, you're going to have, you have a huge problem. And we know about the, the uh, hive collapse that's going on in this country. This is likely part of that. 
So that's those are just an, a sampling of the uh, the articles that we went through to come up with the conclusions that we came to. But now I'd like to address head on the question, and that is about <laughs> whether or not we did cherry picking. Did I cherry pick those articles that I just showed you? Well, it's true that I didn't show you the articles that didn't show a problem. I only showed you the ones that did indicate a problem and indicated what that problem was. But the question now is, do all of the studies, the published studies show harm? And the answer is definitively no. Some show harm while others do not. And it's somewhat dependent on who funded the research. This is not dissimilar from what happens with the tobacco industry, with all of the other, you know, trans fats, with sugar, you name it. it, it those studies that are uh, funded by industry show something that's different from those studies funded by non-industry people. But let's to go look and see what happened back 10 years ago or 11 years ago. Back in 2010, what did the study show? Well, what they found is that only 28% of the industry funded studies show that there was a biological effect from cell phone radiation. Well, that's a small number, one out of five. And But in that same year, they showed that 66% of the studies not funded by industry, 66%, they did show an effect. Again, you look back through the history of smoking and the studies done on smoking, you see the same type of thing. But what tends to happen over time is finally the truth wins out. So let's look at a similar study done in 2020. By the way, you can check these out if you'd like. Um, you know, the links are provided for you. In this case, the neurological effects from radio frequency radiation RFR, 73% of all studies showed that there was a problem. Where the, the genetic effects, only 65% of all studies, but that does include industry studies too. But for the, racks, the free radical generation, that's the oxidative damage, fully 91% of studies show that there's an impact from radio frequency radiation. So no, not all studies show that there's an impact, but certainly now at this point in time, the majority of studies show an impact. Having said that, I also want to let you, let you know that the people that you may bring in from telecom, at least if they say the same things to you that they have, I've heard them say in other public forums, what they will say is that all of the studies that show harm are bunk, they're fringe journals, and the, there is no impact, no negative impact of cell phone radiation, period. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So now, go to the last of our segments, but perhaps give another opportunity for people to ask questions, perhaps about what I just presented. Did you talk about the Harvard report? It's coming up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Save the best for last. So as I mentioned earlier, this is not a scientific issue. It's a political one. Yes, science has a lot to offer in mitigating some of the problems I've just addressed, but let's talk about what's happening right now. What are the political and fiscal drivers that we're dealing with? And in particular, and this came up very early in the commission, why, you know, we, we see that there are problems. Why aren't our regulatory agencies doing something to protect us? I mean, after all, there are thousands of peer reviewed documents showing that there's a problem with RFR. Many countries have lower standards. What do they know that we don't know? FCC standards were set in 1990s. A lot's changed since then. And finally, the FCC didn't answer our questions. Uh, so say this was in, early on in the commission, we came to this. And so we made overtures to the Federal Communications Commission. And that is, please come meet with us. If you don't want to come in person, we'll meet with you via computer or answer our emails. We got stonewalled. Uh, we sent emails and what we would get from them is they'd say, oh, well, if you want an answer to that question, look on our website. We'd go to the website and it didn't answer the question. So they really stonewalled us. And it wasn't long after that became, before we came up with this Harvard study. If, if you have any questions at all about what's going on, and why we're not being protected, I highly recommend that you at least read a little bit of this study. It doesn't take long. 
and it's the title, as you can see, is how the Federal Communication Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. Uh, you can click on it and read it here. Uh, I, I love this. <laughs> it says it. So I'm going to read to you what I have in quotes here. Industry controls the FCC through a soup to nut stranglehold that extends from its well-placed campaign spending in Congress through its control of the FCC's congressional oversight committees to its persistent agency lobbying. So that is what's going on. If you look at the leadership in the FCC and you look at the leadership of even the uh, some of the telecommunications uh, industry groups, associations, and some of their so the companies themselves, they rotate through. They rotate into the leadership roles within the FCC and then back to the telecom industry. So they're not going to change something or put in regulations that are going to harm the interests of the industry that they're representing. They're not representing the people anymore, in my opinion. So I, again, encourage you to read this. It does spell things out pretty clearly. Some of the things you'll see shows that the wireless industry is using a very similar playback uh, to the one used by Big Tobacco. And that is you get a huge you know, war chest of money and you spend freely. Uh, you, they have like over 500 lobbyists and they're spending in this, by the way, this number is from 2017, I'll have to update it, but they're getting uh, you know, huge amounts of contrib uh, campaign contributions. And that's why legislators are afraid to try to enact any legislation that would go against the interests of big telecom. That's what's going on. And, uh, and this is all the way, by the way, documented uh, in the, the Harvard report. And this goes back even big tobacco back in 1998 is still claiming that there's no proof that smoking causes cancer. So deny, deny, deny. And we're seeing the same type of tactics in telecom. They just deny that there's any harm of radiation. Oh, there's no claim. There's no valid science showing that there's, that there's a problem. But indeed, there is. Just as there were, were problems associated with smoking back when the first reports came out to what we know right now. I got to just also give it, I don't want to drag on this too much, uh, but to give you an example of what the say, telecommunication industry will do, CTIA, by the way, is Cellular Telecommunications Industries Association, sued Berkeley over the following ordinance. Berkeley uh, had the same recognition that people didn't understand the risks associated with their cell phones. And so they wanted the retailers of cell phones to hand out a piece of paper whenever they sold a cell phone. And this is what was written on that, that piece of paper that they were supposed to hand out. The CTIA sued over that because remember the claim of the industry is that there is no harm associated with industry. Although if you look in your phone, you'll find that the same information is given in your phone. You have to search for it, but it's there. So CTIA sued Berkeley. And the thing that's weird is that they won. And the reason I'm showing this is I feel like you need to have an understanding of how powerful these groups are, these industry groups are, and what ends they will be are willing to go to, to keep this out of the public and the mainstream public. Now, some of the things I'm telling you in this presentation, you're probably going, wow, this is serious stuff. How come we don't know about it? You would expect this to be on the front page of newspapers. But please consider, where does a lot of the advertising revenue come from for many news outlets? Who advertises a huge amount? You know the companies, the telecom industries. So apparently, and from what I've seen, news outlets are very unwilling to bite the hand that feeds them, so to speak. That's why you don't want to hear about this. And that makes it all the easier for companies to keep quiet the real risks associated with exposure. You know, I'd like to add about the, the Berkeley case. That okay. it, it won repeatedly until the, the, the judge ruling, um, which stopped its implementation because of the FCC saying, hey, there's no reason to change our limits. They're safe at any speed. They're safe even if they exceed the limit, which is shown in IEEE publications to occur when the device is touching the body. And that was so, um, it was really shocking because it was such a, 
really benign statement. It's just saying the fact when it's in your pocket, when it's touching your body, it can exceed FCC limits. And then the FDA and the FCC came in saying that's fine. And then that led to uh, this, this court ruling, um, which potentially, I believe, can potentially change in time, depending on, on what happens. But that this is where we are for now. Uh, and it's really a unbelievable, um, uh, what would the word be? It's just about <laughs> our government and transparency. It's just so, um, it just not, not how democracy is supposed to function, where people aren't afforded the truth. I fully agree. Thank you for that. So, so, okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> actually, I'm going to wrap up and we're going to be hearing you from you some more. And that is... Uh, <laughs> Something good is now happening. And that is, I mean, how long can you keep a myth going? And I think we're really finding out because this has gone from 1996 when the FCC first put those rules into place until just this past February when your group, Ms. Scarato, was part of this lawsuit against the FCC. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that because it's your lawsuit, you're the expert, but I do want to point out that there is progress being made. So the suit was broad, brought, and I have a link here to the suit itself and some of some bullets associated with it. But basically, it's saying, FCC, your rules are crazy. You didn't go through the proper procedures to come up with the guidelines that you've established. You need to relook those. And the great place to end this is that that lawsuit was vic victorious. So there are, is progress being made that if we get realistic limits on the radiation, then we can protect people. But until that's done, it's going to be a little bit challenging. But the fact that there was victory back last August, Friday the 13th, is really encouraging to me because I am seeing chinks or cracks in the dam, probably a good analogy, for the FCC, there have been a, a couple of town ordinances or towns that were looking at the approval of rollout of the rollout of 5G that said, oh, we better put this on hold. And they named this victory as the rationale for putting things on hold. So that's the end of my presentation. And now is a good time to entertain any questions you might have. And perhaps, Ms. Scarato, you could, you could put in some of your own comments about this. Sure, I'll, I'll actually put a link to our action campaign uh, informing people about the need to tell their members of Congress about the court case, because what it did is sort of unveil or uncover the reality that those limits are based on science that was, as you said, from the 80s, but there hasn't been a robust review of the totality of the science by our health and safety agencies in, in looking at everything from the brain impacts, oxidative stress, um, and environmental impacts, children's vulnerability, none of that was reviewed when the FCC decided a few years ago to affirm those limits. And that became clear in our case. And it has been mandated back to the FCC. So that means that they are to now re-examine the record and come up with a, uh, a, a record, or maybe we hope, to relook at the limits that they set in 1996. So um, I have a question. Uh, do you want to comment on the pilot stopping 5G rollout due to concerns over flight radar problems? I don't know if you're familiar with what's happened with the spectrum. And um, not the yeah. exact problem. I've done a lot of work in my career for the Federal, uh, Federal Aviation Administration. So I've done things like sighting, and I've looked. I've done a lot of work on what's called electromagnetic compatibility. And that is what happens if you introduce a radiator at a particular frequency, how will it interfere with the operation of your, the devices that are needed to fly the aircraft? And I know from experience that they are very conservative. So what you have happening in this case is some of the frequencies associated with 5G are pretty close to the radar frequencies and could easily cause bleed over, cause uh, co-channel interference, or perhaps even intermodulation product interference, just forms of interference that make the radar not work as accurately. So I don't think it would cause the radar to stop. I'll, I'll read up more on this and I have some articles waiting for me to read, but basically it would probably just degrade the performance of those devices. And of course, if you're trying to land aircraft with precision, that's something you don't want to have happen. You don't want to degrade your equipment. You know, the thing I think that's interesting about this, Professor Chamberlain, is that there's all, there's this 
I mean, it's made the news all over last week. And it's all about how equipment is being interfered with rather than that consideration of how are people's bodies, birds, bees, and trees, how are they being interfered with? How is our cellular function and the way our, our biology being interfered with? And we need to shift you know, the limelight onto this question that has just been buried by, by industry uh, amplified messages uh, that there's, sa there's safety and it's pro proven to be safe. So, oh, yeah. please put questions in the chat and in the, um, or in the Q and A, and I will bring them forward. Um, so I have a thank you for not giving up and keeping up the pressure. Um, this talk is inspiring me to wake up and thank you, Dr. Chamberlain, for being oh. open and learning and changing your earlier held views. And thank you for effectively and persistently communicating. Oh. You're most welcome. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I do wonder about people who work for the telecom industry. They're saying things that I believe they know are not true. And so having the opportunity to get the word out allows me to fulfill my mission as a, as a good citizen, I think. And so thank you for listening and thank you for spreading the word. So um, one of the most uh, important moments in the in the talk was in, in your commission's proceedings. I mean, they were it was incredible, and and you can go online and read the minutes that are all in the report. But there, were, you had the National Toxicology Program scientists present, mm -hmm. and there was a moment, you know, where um, Commissioner uh, Ricky Ardi said, "I am still not clear. Your study was designed to test non-heating damage." You found damage. So doesn't that mean that the FCC assumption that only heating can cause damage is incorrect and no longer accurate? Would you agree? And um, uh, the National Toxicology Program scientist, uh, Michael Wide said, a lot of people believe that unless you heat tissues, you won't see health effects with radio frequency radiation. This study disproves that as we did not have overheating, but we did see damage. So I wonder if you could talk about this paradigm shift that's happening, because you're an engineer, so you were trained, as you said at the beginning, but this, this is really a paradigm shift in understanding the effects of non-ionizing radiation. So in terms of a paradigm shift, I, I think it's just that people didn't look at it. And this is, is a, a problem in science in general. And that is, if we don't see something, we assume it doesn't exist. Mm. And so in this case, in the case of radiation exposure, we had made some assumptions and we didn't look for something that would contrary to that assumption. That assumption is that the low level fields would cause health problems. We never looked for it. And so it didn't exist. And so for, I mean, I, I by the time that National Toxicology Report came around within the, the commission, I was already aware of the fact that there were health issues. But before then, that's just the nature of science. We didn't see it. It wasn't sitting you know, right in front of us. And so we didn't, uh, weren't able to acknowledge it. Now, um, another uh, an analogy there is maybe lead in the water. You can drink leaded water for quite a while. And nothing happens. So you're not seeing an outcome of doing something, you know, and so you just assume that it's not there until finally it comes around to bite you with the many horrible things that drinking leaded water can do. I do think it's kind of the same thing. We weren't looking for it. And so it was, it didn't exist. So finally you start reading these reports and you go, and the lights go off. Oh, that gets it. Or that explains it. So yeah, it was a kind of, it, it was a ta-da moment and I'm really glad for her asking that question. And by the way, you know that the person, uh, uh, Denise Ricciardi is now Senator Denise Ricciardi and she is, uh, it was one of the authors of the legislation that we wrote that's going to be submitted soon. Right, right. So um, I'm really, I didn't realize it was gonna be a whole year. So this is just, you really pointed that out, how long it takes to move from researching something to legislation and then 
will it pass, you know, next, the next level of, uh, of really getting policy action? What do you recommend to people who are new to this issue, who want to um, just get some movement on this to, to really make that meaningful policy change that they need, they need to happen in their community and other states? What do you recommend that they start with? <laughs> Uh, and the reason you see a pause here is that this is a tough problem to promote. Mm -hmm. It's not a sexy issue. Uh, you, when you're moving forward with something like the rollout of 5G that's going to do all these wonderful things, that's that's sexy. It's sexy for politicians and people like it. It's going to my phone's now going to be able to do more. It's not sexy when you talk about protecting people. At least that's what I found. And that's the response I've gotten from a lot of people. I think that the main thing you can do is let your legislators know, have them watch some of the videos. And I think there's some really good videos out there that explains what the issues are. So if you can get people engaged, people realizing that their cell phones are not benign, they can be fixed, but in order to fix them, we need to acknowledge the problem to begin with. So I would say just spread the word. That's, that's what's motivating me to do this, spreading the word. You're hearing it, you're telling other people. And with people telling people, we can perhaps get the word out to a large enough, get to a critical mass of people so that things will start happening. Right. And, and it also, it will also let people know that by promoting this type of thing, it may prevent cell phones from being placed in their backyards. Because once you come up with a reasonable radiation threshold, then you're not going to be able to put a cell phone in somebody's backyard because you'd be exceeding that threshold. So that's one of the positive things that could come out because the way it's going right now with 5G rolling out so rapidly, the chances that you will have a cell tower located near to your home is pretty high unless something changes. Right, and, and all across the country, there are laws that are moving forward that are loosening the restrictions, allowing antennas to be 30 feet, as in my community, uh, or you know, even no, no limit in some communities, just removing that minimum setback so that companies can just lay out their networks with, with what works for them to be the most financially, uh, you know, make them the most money and, and make the network work. I mean, that's what companies are doing. It's, this is not a conspiracy theory. It's just what makes no. sense. Fine. It's a business plan. This it, is a, it's a business plan and we, and, but it's forgetting, right, about the human health and the environmental issues that have just been buried, buried for decades. Absolutely. So getting the word out is the only thing I know. Yeah. And, and I hope that um, everyone watching will take this report and share it with your representatives and with your elected officials, because it really is. It, it synthesizes a lot of these, th these issues. It answers these questions and puts forward uh, the results of the majority of the commission having looked at this for, for a year. And so mm -hmm. intensely as you have, it's right. really a critical document for our elected officials. I agree. So um, I have a question as to how, uh, and another appreciation, much much appreciation. Oh, oh thank you, I see that. <laughs> how, how do you, what do you think is going to be the hardest hurdle to get through? What, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of this? So the legislation, we, we wanted to see, we said, we wanna go big or go home. We wanna do something that's going to protect people. And the only thing that's going to protect people is to lower their radiation exposure. And that can be achieved pretty much only through setting back towers from where people live. And you saw in an earlier slide that that has a lot of fiscal ramifications. To, to put in a tower in a good place is gonna cost a lot of money, but it's necessary to protect people. So it is going to be fought tooth and nail. So we did our best to, be, to come up with reasonable legislation that really would protect people. It's there, it's waiting on the books to be voted on next fall. And we're pretty sure that uh, telecom is going to hit us with everything they have. So what we need to do is come up with as much 
solid evidence as we can, because some of the people who are going to be hearing this are, are not in the pocket of telecom. They're going to be legislators who have genuine concern for the people they represent. And they may say, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, we'll support you because what you're proposing is in the best interest of our citizens. So we're hopeful that we can turn it around. We need to have the right information and we need to get the right information to the right people. I so see. that's what we're looking forward to. And, and, and Frank, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because I do know the power of telecom. That's one of the reasons I gave some of the examples that I did about what they will or are capable of doing. You know, when when seatbelts first came out in airbags, the industry fought hard saying they couldn't do it, they didn't want to do it, it didn't make sense. But really what's being asked here is for the companies to design their networks in safer ways. Yeah, um, they can do it. They and do it. if we, right, they, they can do it. And also if we just promoted Wired more often, all those places where they're pulling out, where you know, I can't even get a landline in my community. It's not possible. I have to go through the internet, through an internet company, but all the landlines, they're not maintaining them. And that's, that's a problem for safety issues. Like, well, why aren't we supporting all of these wired networks, which work to communicate so that then there's, there's not the need to have more and more wireless connectivity when we're doing most of our work like here in my office, I can use a wire. I don't need to have it be wireless, right? I have my phone. I do not need to use a cell phone. I can plug my cell phone into the ethernet if I needed to. So it's possible to do these raising things. Raising a really good point. And this is about money. <laughs> it's what you keep hearing in politics, follow the money. It turns out that wired and, and some of the money, a lot of the money has been designated for wired broadband but it's being used for wireless broadband. And why? It's because that's where the profit is. And that's where they're gonna make more money. So if somebody is willing to pursue this and fight the telecom industry, I think they have a great opportunity because everything you just said, Ms. Grotto, is absolutely correct. The, you, know, you plug in your phone, it works great. And you plug in your computer, it's gonna work much, much faster and be far more secure. Why won't they do it? Well, they can make more money other ways. And it's really too bad when it boils down to being only profit and profit goes only be, you know, before people. I get the idea of making money and it's when I work with industry. And when I work with industry, that's my objective. Let's help you guys make money, but not at the expense of people, please. Right. Yes, and, and the expense of, of our environment, I think, one of the most important recommendations, there were four, 15 recommendations of the New Hampshire Commission, and two of them centered on impacts to plants, birds, insects, and pollinators, calling for the um, agencies with expertise to develop limits that protect them because they are in the plume, they're, they're right close, closer than people will be to these antennas. And you'll, you're even going to have levels that exceed FCC limits in there that they're flying, they're perching on top of the antennas, and they're not protected. There hasn't been, you know, research to say what level is safe for a bird, right. what level is safe for a bat, how do we protect bees? There was just a study that came out, I don't know if you saw it, the one on mosquitoes. I mean, I there's been, that one. it was showing that that at the higher frequencies that would be used in 5G, just like the study that looked at bees and, and the five insects that was done about two years ago that was part of your commission review, yeah. this study looked at, an in, at mosquitoes and found that it would increase its absorption quite, much higher using the higher frequencies, even at the same amount of radiation. So as you mm -hmm. change that frequency, the uh, the absorption into the body changes, and that can impact the uh, the behavior, the the life of the mosquito, which maybe some of us might want. Uh, but <laughs> what about all the other insects, right? And what does it mean when you decimate the mosquitoes? What about well, you, know, you lose your bats. You? What you lose your bats, right? And, and then there's all these other insects that are being exposed that 
right. that are just the size of a mosquito. And um, so I thought that was just, it's just all really, I recommend everyone who's listening, go to the New Hampshire Commission Report, download it, take it to your members of Congress, share it with your community, talk about it at your city council meetings, you know, go to every city council meeting and be like, today I'm gonna to talk about the first three recommendations, then the next three, then the next three, and just get them up to speed on, on this issue. You know, there's something else I should mention. You're asking what people can do. I'm on a board of trustees for a school and I brought this issue before them. I didn't get very far, but they are aware of it now and aware that they may be, <clears throat> they, the trustees, the fellow trustees may be liable so you're now exposing your students to something that can harm them. It's just like asbestos, that if you're not insured for it and nobody's insured for it, then it may become the trustees that become liable. And that seems to get people's attention. People need to know, just let them know that exposure gets, has, health, has known health ramifications and that the people who expose their, the, the students to that become liable. And we're beyond getting beyond the time of plausible deniability for, for this issue. Right. And the only way to, to get to that point is to have people informed. So even if they're going to say, sorry, you're ahead of your time, as I was told many times, or sorry, we're not going to make a change, FCC limits are met, you have presented them with the information. So they can't say they weren't presented with that information. Mm -hmm. Right. And the commission recommends that in schools, there be wired rather than wireless when possible to decrease the exposure to the children. You mm -hmm. think about all these nursery schools, what do they even need it for? It's unnecessary. We're not following the rules, the radiation protection rules of as low as reasonably possible, which really can be done. It's like a first easy low hanging fruit. Just mm -hmm. use wired when possible. Mm -hmm. Turn it off, you know, if it's not being used, especially with the nursery schools or the younger grades, and um, a lot that can be done. Although I was just at a college, and I have to tell you, I hurts my heart to see what's happening in the colleges. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in our higher educational institutions to have them be educated because the kids are on their cell phones. I know everyone knows this, but I, I guess I don't get out enough, and the the phones are just up against their breast or, or they hold them in their arm like this. My daughter had her phone carrying it around like this. And she knows. Yeah. Yep. So we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, get, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anything else? And I, I thank you so much, uh, oh, Dr. Chamberlain, pleasure. for presenting. Nope, that's about it. Um, if people have questions, follow on questions, let me know. Uh, please let people know where they can get the notes. Um, actually, I need to send them to you, right? Yes, the slides, oh. that would be great. And you're also doing some videos that you'll be getting out. Right. Um, and so I do have a series and you can check that out on, um, on YouTube. Just Google my name, Kent Chamberlain, and it should take you there. Or Google, no, YouTube my name. Right. But I, I don't know <laughs> your name on YouTube. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate you taking the time and for all your work with the New Hampshire Commission. And I also appreciate that you are taking the time to educate the community about this after. And it's, um, it, it's, it's moving mountains. So thank you. I hope so. Thank you so much. Thanks. Goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.